I am Krina Pentelejczuk and you are listening to Mind the Training podcast. Today we speak with Alisa Nagnostakis. Alice is the founder of Vertical Development Institute. She is a, also founded Mind Learners Transformational Coaching School and she has a PhD in vertical development. These are one of the few things that I want to mention about her. Be, be, beyond that, Alice is a great human. Uh, it was a real pleasure to talk to her. And you will see in our conversation that we've touched upon what vertical development means and how it impacts our relationship inside organization teams, but also in other uh, personal life. Um, I think this discussion that we, we had was uh, one that, yes, touched upon the vertical development um, idea, but it also brought a few of... Um, real life situations in which we can use vertical development. I wanted to, to bring a, bring her in front of you, especially because I have heard about vertical development a year and a half ago, maybe, and I can see the potential of this concept being introduced into organization and making good things, having a positive impact on what's happening inside organization and uh, especially looking at relationships inside work environment. And um, yeah, I had a great conversation with her. And uh, I can only hope that you will be tuned into listening to us as well. I need to mention her website, which is verticaldevelopmentinstitute.com. Look it up. You have a lot of things in there, especially uh, studies and research in the vertical development. If you're curious to, uh, to find out more, you can also find some um, tests you can take in order to identify where stage are you at in your life right now, vertical development wise. Um, and yeah, just uh, tune in. Here is Alice. So welcome, Alice. It's a pleasure to have you in Mind the Trading podcast. And finally, we have a real researcher with us. So oh. uh, <laughs> today we're going to talk about something really, really interesting. I've been uh, in contact with the concept of vertical development for a year and a half now, but I know you've been studying more into it, have been going deeper into it. So it's uh, really exciting for me to hear about more about what's going on there. So um Welcome. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you for having me, Krina. <laughs> let's and start. And uh, the thing, <laughs> let's start. I was just, uh, I was hooked on what you said with the real researcher, because what I'm learning is the more I learn, the less I know. So the, the benchmark for what makes a real researcher is way up, up there. And I'm still well, to, to humbly me, working my way towards it. <laughs> to me, you are a real researcher. So I'm going to oh, count on you today you. To, to, to enlighten us with a, a lot of amazing information. So let's uh, start by telling a little bit uh, to, to the people how, what, what is, what is vertical development? What's that? So very shortly, what's going on? What's vertical development? Yeah, uh, so vertical development is a type of human growth, really, uh, another description of how human beings grow towards more maturity, more wisdom, if you like. Um, and it's been around for quite some time. The, the term vertical is more recent and it's become ever more popular in recent years. Um, and for, for a long time, when we spoke about development in organizations, we mainly referred to skills development. You, you add tools to your toolkit as a leader, as an employee and so forth. And we went to parenting parenting courses, same kind of mindset, learning tools for parenting toolkit. The vertical dimension talks about the need to actually grow our capacity for more complex thinking, for broader perspectives. So there's, uh, if you want, the, the most uh, um, well-known analogy uh, to make this, this distinction is of a cup and the water you pour in the cup. Horizontal is the water you pour in the cup of your mind, if your mind was the cup. The vertical development is the changing the transformation of the cup itself. So mm -hmm. there's something fundamental in how you think uh, that changes in vertical development, whereas in horizontal, what you think, the contents of your thinking and your mind um, change. Both are important, but they're quite distinct. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know that when I first um, encountered this um, notion and I d dug a little bit there to see what's going on, it was very interesting for me to understand why some of the participants I train or I work with individually are sparkling and they're, you know, getting it and then bringing all that we have worked with um, to their day-to-day -day lives or to their, to their work. And some of them know. So, uh I said, okay, this is something interesting. I might use this into helping people to to learn a bit better. I know that mm -hmm. uh, there are some stages. Maybe we can mention them a little bit and say very, very little about each of them. And mm -hmm. I, uh, what I uh, found uh, that people find interesting is uh, how many of us are in each of the stages. And maybe you tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Um, I, I resonate with what you said around being drawn to this from the perspective of a facilitator, of a facilitator supporting others, because that that was the trigger for me to trying to understand why the same learning experience lands very differently for different people. The stages is um, I, I, there's a disclaimer on the stages mm -hmm. because um, I think everybody who finds out about this theory is drawn to the idea of, oh, there are there is a series of predictable stages that we grow through towards more complexity. And it's so cool to kind of uh, test or map where you're at. And then what do you do with that? But as with any psychometric, it's so easy to confuse the map with the territory. So real development is way messier than any set of stages. Uh, or of boxes. So stages are not, um, they are indications of where on the journey a person might be most of the time, because at our worst, we go back in our development and we all have our really bad moments mm -hmm. when we behave in immature ways and we realize we're not the person we know we can be. And we also have our moments of grace almost when we almost tap into a, a more, even wiser version of ourselves than we employ in day-to-day -day life. So the disclaimer is, hold the stages idea lightly mm -hmm. um, and I all, often call them octaves and equate this I, this whole developmental journey with a piano because I think it's easier to imagine each stage is an octave and you add more octaves to your piano you're able to really play a beautiful melody when you access all of your octaves mm -hmm. not just the higher ones not just the lower ones Okay. But that being said, there are different stage models. So I'll briefly share one of them that's very widely used in organizations, which um, has been refined by multiple researchers over the years. But the last person who's done most work on it is a researcher from Boston University called William Torbert or Bill Torbert. Um, he talks about seven stages of development with opportunities being the first stage, which is for most people, it happens mostly in middle school, teenage years, <laughs> even earlier than that. So rarely do adults actually live their whole lives stuck or playing just this octave. Very egocentric, very uh, focused on, on self and our own needs. If you look on the global stage, you might find a couple of interesting case studies of people seemingly operating from opportunists most of the time, which okay. I find fascinating. Um, about 5% um, we know from current research that people are actually day-to-day -day kind of playing that one octave um, because it's very, very hard to effectively operate in life if you're incapable of thinking of anybody else's needs but your own. Okay. But with every octave, there's a there's a strength to it. So as we grow through the octaves, tapping into the potential and the strengths of the previous ones can be beneficial. So for example, regardless of where you're playing your own piano at the moment there are opportunities in the opportunists things like being brave enough to just raise your voice and defend yourself or set boundaries or say no to things some of that courage is actually tapping into the good side of the opportunist so it's not all bad uh but it's limiting Okay, but we need um, so it from time to time. We need to go back to a point. We absolutely need it. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is why the idea of integrating all the stages and purposefully going where you need to in the moment is actually more valuable than striving towards the later one, the more advanced, let's say, ones as a purpose in itself. That also can be limiting. Mm -hmm. So most people outgrow their opportunities, then they shift into the next octave, which is called the diplomat in Torbert's model. And the diplomat is that octave of life where we care so much about what other people think. 
it's the what will people think of me and I think we all have our examples and we all can remember when we've been or maybe we're still spending a lot of time in that diplomat stage Mm -hmm. it's where we take our self-esteem or we define ourselves through the tribe's opinion of us whatever the tribe might be so it's very hard in this stage to say no and we shift and we do everything we do based on what other people might think of us so we, we seek approval we seek approval quite a bit. You, you can think of them as a bit of a pendulum swing. So when you reach the limits of the self-centered one, you kind of veer into the next one, which is all about others, and you lose the self in it a little bit. So there's a lot about approval. There's a lot of difficulty of saying no. Um, when you find yourself saying yes to things you don't really want to do, you could kind of bet that it's a bit of that diplomat energy playing out in that situation. So it's a good reflective kind of cue to go. If I have trouble saying no or setting healthy boundaries, how do I define myself? Where do I take my my sense of self-worth? Is it a bit too much reliant on other people's opinions of me? And the fear of disappointing them or letting them down or being different from the group or the norm. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, diplomat. And about 10, 15% of the population will spend a lot of time operating from that stage. In organizations, usually people are pressured to kind of shift into the next one. So the pendulum has to swing again because you're required to offer something to the group to find your own unique voice. Uh, the leaving home quite often for many people is a trigger into going into the next one, which is called the expert. Expert stage is the stage of our lives when we find our unique voice. We are able to detach ourselves from the group. We stop defining ourselves exclusively through what the group says we should be, say, or do. And we start to focus a bit more inwards and go, what are my qualities? What are my abilities? What am I really good at? It's that phase where people invest in their education or they they get good at a certain profession or they acquire some sort of expertise in a field and they come to rely quite a bit on that. Um, and depending on which research you look at, up to 30% of people in organizations currently or, or recurrently operate from experts. Mm-hmm. So it's I a really something. good individual. I know something yeah, knew- and I'm, I'm, I'm sharing mm-hmm. it. I, I'm bringing it to, to the table. What's the downside of the expert? The downside of the expert is the obsession to be right. And I think we all had it. (laughs) Oh, experienced it is that moment when somebody is contradicting you and you go into that black and white thinking, if if they're wrong and I'm right, they can't, or if I'm right and they don't agree with me, they can't be right at the same time. There's almost no space in my mind as the in the expert phase Mm -hmm. to conceive that two conflicting truths can coexist. Okay. Two I, divergent opinions can actually both be right, depending on context. I, I so, remember when I was 22, I did uh, some volunteering in high school, and then I went to university, and in the university, I did some, I got involved in some association, and I got some leading, some projects, and, and I was like, ah, me? I am. And I had a six pages resume, and now it's, I don't know, maybe one page. <laughs> Or something. As it shrunk, so, it has shrunk as you went shrunk. on. Yeah, because I was putting there all the insignificant stuff that I would, I, I thought it would be in, important. But I do remember the feeling of, you know, I'm strong, I know stuff, so get out of my way and stuff like that. But uh, it disappeared <laughs> because I grew well, and yeah, I realized, well, I, you don't know as much, really. Yeah, it's super interesting you say that because I almost, even in the energy with which you share the story, I can almost feel that enthusiasm of the 22-year-old kind of discovering how many things she can do and and finding herself and her self-confidence, which is exactly what that expert octave does for us. It's If you imagine our sense of self consolidating through this arc of development, that's a stage where it finally starts. You have to almost grasp who you are and you're able to describe yourself. I'm good at this. I know this thing. Mm-hmm. I have the six page CV and look at me. And it, I don't think it necessarily has to come from, a, I don't know, an ego place, but it's actually a place of celebrating our uniqueness in a yeah. sense and, and yeah. re- okay. reveling in how cool it is to know who I am. It, it, what's lacking and you said that is the fact that I couldn't perceive that there was more to it or maybe the uh, well rationally on a superficial level yes of course I have still stuff to learn but look at me I'm so I've done so yeah. many things by this age so ha, 
but mm-hmm. the, maybe that was was lacking the the um, um, looking forward or the 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 wideness of the uh, looking towards life in a different way. Like yes, and that's yeah. it. And maybe that was lacking. And then amazingly, yeah. something happened and it disappeared. <laughs> no it, more expert yeah. uh. you outgrew it <laughs> um we always say they're all there we, we all we we have the energies of all of these stages and the capacities of all of these stages within us but we outgrow them we're, we're able to play a new octave so they fall in the background a little bit mm-hmm. uh the previous ones yeah and i, 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 I would have... be curious what triggered can you remember what triggered it for you then they shift into the next stage i don't i don't think it was a specific trigger okay. i think it was just be diving into real life so to speak you know getting a job uh-huh. uh doing stuff that was beyond you know playing volunteering and stuff like that and then having to do stuff that i didn't necessarily like yeah mm-hmm. uh and uh this guy, uh, going out uh, meeting people that were smarter than me and then realizing, ah, well, mm, you could do better. I mean, look at these people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. These are so... Yeah, amazing. getting curious about what other people might teach you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Maybe. Mm. Yeah, let's uh, not uh, get this wrong. I still have the, the feeling of an expert from time to time. But uh, the, um, you know, the the bluntness of, okay, I am what I am is not there anymore. So we have the uh, opportunist, the diplomat, the expert. What's next? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Next is achiever. achiever. Um, so even listening to you, what the what what some of the potential triggers or, or catalysts have been for you, it, it sounds like it was something that took you out of your comfort zone in different ways, and that's kind of what tends to happen. We reach the limits of our current octave. So, for example, in organizations, quite often people shift out of expert and into achiever when they are put in positions of leadership hmm. based on the results they created from their individual contributor expert roles. So you're really, really good at what you do. You deliver. And that's a story I've seen. And I think oh. it'll be familiar to a lot of people, or professional people watching this um where you you almost reach the limits of and there's this assumption you you are an amazing expert you're going to be a great team leader and nothing could be further from the truth <laughs> because <laughs> team leading requires a whole different set of internal capacities the capacity to listen more deeply the capacity to be curious about other people's perspective the capacity to bring different people around a table and solve problems together instead of you taking it on and doing it yourself and I think for those of us working in the space of organizations, a lot of the work we do with teams and leaders has to do with this baffling transition from expert into achiever, where you mm-hmm. go, why isn't it working anymore? I was so successful doing it all on my own. And very often people perpetuate the same behaviors. They take on their team's work and they do it themselves because that was their pattern and they were really good at it. Mm-hmm. So the achiever is a an octave of development, which for a long time has been considered the epitome of managerial effectiveness. So it was considered an optimal octave for a good manager mm-hmm. because it, it allows people to broaden their horizons, uh, to be more flexible in accepting different points of view, in changing their own point of view, if they're offered, you know, contrary evidence. Um, there's more more inclination towards introspection that starts to emerge at achievers. So people start to ask more questions. It's a it's an octave where uh, again in organization I'm noticing a flourishing of searching for psychometrics to map out your team's strength or to better understand. A lot of achiever leaders are super keen on the psychometrics because it's it's a r- genuine honest attempt to better understand. Mm-hmm. how can I work better with my team? So this type of curiosity is a bit less present um, at the earlier octaves, but it really starts to come out mm-hmm. from achiever onwards and mm-hmm. way accelerates way forward into the next ones. But this is the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, purpose and meaning and why am I doing the work I'm doing also is something. So it's not just about um, efficiency with the uh, expert is I want to get the, I want to do the task. With Achiever is more, okay, in six months, where is this decision going to take us? How is it going to impact other people? We broaden our capacity to mm-hmm. to conceptualize and to project into the future. 
I'm very, I'm very glad you're saying you, this about um, in between expert and uh, achiever because I, I I want to stay a little bit here because uh, most of my work is done here and with the achievers and maybe a little bit higher, but it starts from here. So I'm working a lot with leaders. I'm working a lot with teams. And I do see this type of struggle because uh, especially in um, here in Yash, we have a lot of IT companies and uh, because there is a lot of growth, growth very fast, some people might, I don't know, tomorrow morning I'm a team leader. Why? Because I'm doing so good at what I'm doing. And they have I'm issues. an exceptional programmer, therefore I can have a team now. Yes. Um, and uh, I have a program which is called I'm a new manager, which by the way, people I will be launching online self-paced uh, in December, maybe early January, stay tuned. Um, and what we do is we take on the the soft side of being a leader. And it's amazing to see how people who think of themselves as being experts, I know my stuff, I really do. They're baffled and uh, that they, they don't know how to to deal with people and what's going on and why do I have to do this and why does, isn't this working? And you didn't mention the fact that I'm taking on things and doing it for my team. And I'm actually right now working with a, with a manager who has, a, um, <laughs> I call it... Um, he doesn't have time. He doesn't have time. So that's a, he that's needs a... <laughs> to, to, to solve everything right away because he needs to see that result as fast as possible. So what he's doing, he's going from uh, one place to another, taking on, okay, this uh, work from this department is impacting my work. I'm going to do it. And then I can do my job. Oh, there is another department who is impacting my work. Oh, I'm going to do that as well. Why? Um, you don't understand. So I'll do it for you. And then we have an issue in the team because this doesn't work on a long term. Yeah. Yeah. So of course. Well, and there's what? a transfer. I'm I'm taking away some of my team's agency, some of my team's capacity to grow because I'm doing all of this stuff for them. Mm -hmm. But I, I would point out that the uh, struggle with time is a very typical achiever problem. So this this octave opens up opportunities. Is, but like every octave, it has its downsides and its limitations. And one of the limitations is that people operating from Achiever, they're perpetually out of time because there is always more that they want to do than the 24 hours in a day. Mm -hmm. And they've, they have this wrestle, struggle, fight, constant fight uh, relationship with time. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe and, we have an expert to um, which, towards Achiever. I would say so. It sounds like it's that there are elements of both in that that story you just mm -hmm. described. Mm -hmm. uh, the expert is the part of doing it yourself, but the struggle with time is more of the achiever issue because this person, I can imagine he, he sees the results that he wants to get to, which is very much the achiever kind of mindset, mm -hmm. but he goes about solving it in the expert way, kind of do it yourself. Mm -hmm. How can I help this type of person? if I am their manager? Look, I think um, if you, when you start to, to tap into um, this developmental kind of lens, there's almost this question, what is the thing that is at the edge of this person's, what's the next, next note for them? Mm -hmm. So for example, um, if they're doing too much of the work for the team, what are some of the beliefs or convictions that they hold that are perpetuating this pattern? So there are coaching processes that I'm sure you're using as well, where we investigate beliefs. And one of the ways to support development is to get people to take a belief that's now... Um, so an example would be the belief that whatever I do myself is better done than anybody else would do mm -hmm. that work yep. so just taking that belief and looking at it and recognizing it is just a lens so not trying to get rid of it but inviting people to experiment with shaking it up a little bit in the real world so is this belief really true every single time so people might organize safe experiments that feel a bit risky but not too risky so they might delegate a tiny thing or they might refrain from giving the solution in a meeting where they would have jumped and told people what to do. And they ask some good questions instead and let the team come up with the answers. 
So there's always this incremental kind of pushing people out of their comfort zone towards that thing. That would be the developmental stretch for them. Mm -hmm. So if, if it is letting go of the work yourself, but while honoring that we have these mechanisms, we have these deeply held beliefs that have served us, yes. which is why they often say when you tap into the next octave, you're almost breaking down your old worldview and, and, and expanding into new understandings of what's possible. So if your world old worldview was, and it proved true for many years, whatever I do myself is well done. It's so hard to realize that that same worldview does not serve me in this context. I'm, it's just backfiring. I'm demotivating my team. I'm disengaging all the other departments who are just fed up with me getting into their own business, into their business all the time. So mm -hmm. might I check whether this belief is still true? Or there's a new one that could replace it that's more expensive, more holds more, the cup mm -hmm. that holds more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the in this way, we might help them explore more of the other octaves they might be using in this uh, situations. Yeah, maybe the expert is not the one that you need now. Maybe the achiever is not the one that you need now. That's maybe it. it's the next one that you need now. And maybe I want to <laughs> help you go <laughs> towards there because I'm thinking in management position, when I am leading a team, I must have maybe, I mean, I don't know, I'm access to more octaves so that I can then connect to, to my team, to my people who probably and most certainly are different. So. Yeah. And then myself for sure, mm -hmm. which is one, I think the, what you just said just now is a, perhaps the reason why organizations are getting more interested in this work, this type of work, because there's almost this understanding that our leaders, the, the more they grow into their roles, the more they have to deal with complexity yeah. with messy situations, with interdependencies. It's not just you and your team. You're actually in an ecosystem. And if you're not able to see the whole system and understand how your actions in your team are connected to the broader strategy or impacting so many other actors in your organization or even beyond. So if you don't have the internal capacity to hold all of that, it's very hard to, to be really good in mm -hmm. a role that requires that kind of complexity. So it's a bit of a fit for purpose. If your role is about delivering very clear results within very clear frameworks that don't necessarily change, you don't necessarily need all of those later octaves. Mm -hmm. But if your role is about making decisions in ambiguity or adapting really quickly or co-creating solutions with other people when there is no one expert who has the right answer, then you need that further complexity. Mm -hmm. So achiever is this almost linchpin in the middle of the, um, the piano, if you want. Mm -hmm. That's kind of this phase that, it, particularly in the last few years, more and more organizations are acknowledging that achiever is no longer enough. Because achiever is an octave that is really good and effective in a relatively stable world where we have perpetual growth and we've got targets and we can forecast for the next three years and all of that stuff that creates predictability so the achiever mindset will go yeah what's the next goal what's the yeah. next target and the achiever is really good at that redefining is the octave that comes after that and that's an octave that is able to grasp more of the system itself so get out of my little square get out of my department get out of this quarterly kind of thinking and think What's happening out there in the world? How is it impacting our company? How is it impacting my team? Can we kind of um, look a little bit at trends in the market that are going to impact us in six months or a year? So this more expansive systemic thinking starts to emerge with redefining. Mm -hmm. um, and a smaller proportion, there are about 30% of people at Achiever, I forgot to mention that, and then it grows smaller and smaller the percentages as you go forward with so, redefining basically in the middle if they the, the achiever are the, the the large proportion the 30 percent of us are there. expert and achiever make up about 60 percent and then because, the rest is and of. do you think it's because we are um i don't know pushed towards those and they say okay this is enough so you're good in this environment as an expert or as an achiever so i i, I don't strive for more because i don't need more maybe I don't know. I'm just, I'm not the yeah. researcher. The cup doesn't really grow unless there is some sort of heat, stress or pressure, heat. Heat, yeah. The to heat. get it to grow. Yeah. Nick mm -hmm. Petrie uh, is a, one yeah. of the a really good voices in this space. He he talks about heat experiences and it's a really good way of looking at it. If you don't have heat experiences, 
you're very unlikely to grow vertically. Mm-hmm. And there's even this uh, realization in, in the field that the higher up the octaves you are growing, the more choice plays a role. Because you almost need to start making yourself uncomfortable on purpose in order to continue growing. Mm-hmm. Unlike children who grow vertically because nature programmed them to grow vertically. <laughs> it just happens <laughs> unless we really stifle it. But it's still mm-hmm. it's vertical growth and cognitive development in childhood. They're very connected and they kind of happen on their own accord. And even in life, up to a point, life presents you with those challenges, whether you look for them or not. So you can kind of grow. Mm-hmm. But there comes a point where you need to start really looking for growth so a lot of people when they transition between achiever and redefining they start to almost instinctively seek coaching go to therapy to try to understand their past and where their patterns of thought have come from Uh, get into a lot of personal development I, i can recognize a client who is probably in those octaves even without testing them mm-hmm. for the sheer uh almost I, I meant to say desperation, but that's not, not <laughs> although it can feel like that. I'm desperate Wish. to understand myself. I'm Desire. desperate to make sense of the world. What's going on? Like, it feels like my life is no longer making sense to me. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas that achiever, you've got it figured out. You've got all your boxes to tick. You kind of have your goals. When you when I start to shift into redefining, a lot of those success props fall, fall out. And it feels like the bottom has fallen out of life. Uh, it's a very tough space to be in redefining for many people redefining it's again uh, d- directed towards ourselves yes the the pendulum. ourselves in the world it's it's a phase of life yeah you, you're very sure of yourself um at achiever and what you might want of life and then when you go into redefining um so, some researchers say that your sense of self is at its maximum solidity in achiever so the that is the clearest you're, you'll ever be about who you are and then it gets unclear at again. It starts at achiever, it consolidates. At redefining your all over of, the place. I don't know what's going on with me. Who am I? What are my values? What's my purpose in life? So you start to ask all of these crazy existential questions, or a lot of people I'm generalizing here, but mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. we're talking in generalities. But that's kind of the so the the sense of self has grown to this solid thing, and then it starts to fall apart. Because you start to realize that even your sense of self is a bit of a construct. It's kind of who you think you are, but you have so many roles. And at redefining, you start to realize the multitude of people inside of you. (laughs) It starts to become apparent you're not just one way or one thing. Mm -hmm. So a multitude of people inside of us. So many people to realize. That's scary, at least. That's scary. So many people inside. So it's normal because I have a lot of clients that say, well, it's like I have... I don't want to be, you know, two-faced or something, but I act differently. And well, you're like a diamond, I'd like to say, with multiple facets. So maybe you're trying to discover them. You're beginning to discover them right now. But yeah, it's uncomfortable to discover. Well, I'm not one way. Something happened and I'm more ways than one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have redefining. Uh, We have redefining and... I, I was just asking um, then, how, how, how much, how many of us are there? Oh, um, the the numbers are very approximate because we actually haven't had, as far as I know, in the last few years, a, a solid upgrade. I, from the unofficial, unpublished numbers that I've seen from different collaborations that I'm in, uh, the number of people that redefining has grown quite a bit. So. A particular organization I collaborate with who measures adult development, um, they're estimating that in some organizations up to 30 or even 40% of senior leaders can operate at redefining. And many of them are in hiding. So they don't show up as the complex selves. They play earlier octaves because they feel that's expected of them. And that leads to a lot of internal conflict. Mm -hmm. It's that manager who no longer feels like they're a part of something, who doesn't really agree maybe to the direction of the organization, who doesn't feel at home in the organization anymore. But for safety's sake, they kind of play small. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or they go into the other extreme and they challenge the system. They rock the boat so much until the system ejects them. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of that playing out. A lot of people who are going through this deeper transformation themselves, but they don't really know, nor are they encouraged 
to bring that growth into the workplace. And I think that's hugely challenging for so many organizations at the moment. Mm-hmm. So they're not being nice. Even collectively. They're if not... you think of COVID, I was just yeah. reflecting on um, how redefining plays out at the collective level where, you know, work from home all of a sudden, we've redefined the way we work. And so many people have questioned what is normal, what is expected. So it's this whole disruption has pushed us collectively into a bit of a redefining kind of space Mm -hmm. that we can all recognize, I think. Mm -hmm. So people that no longer recognize the roles, they're not nice, or maybe they're playing it nice just to be safe, but then at some point they're not playing it nice and they seek out different things if the system does not allow them to not play nice to challenge and to see they don't want to play by the rules anymore Mm -hmm. they are just yeah what's this are we playing live what's going on okay so we have redefining do we have more alice we have more we have transforming which is uh, the next after redefining there are a few after that but i don't think it's worth tapping into that because that takes us into a bit of a more transcendent territory and you don't really find those last last stages that much in organizations but transforming is the stage that a lot of organizations are really aspiring they're hoping they can see their most senior leaders growing into because it's a stage where you get the perspectives of the redefining but without the turmoil turmoil of the redefining so Leaders operating from transforming are way more comfortable operating in ambiguity, making good decisions without necessarily having enough data. They they have way more tolerance for discomfort, distress, disruption, all the messiness that a lot of senior leaders have to operate in right now. Um, Mm -hmm. Strategic thinking and being able to see the details and how those connect, that's capacity of transforming. genuine collaboration or sharing power no longer feeling like you've got to hold all the power being comfortable letting people shine do their own thing so there are a lot of beautiful capacities at its best because transforming as redefining as all the others has its downsides um that if when they're at their best it can shine what are the downsides of transforming that the downsides of transforming can be when um, I've seen leaders operate from this octave where they just lose um, they lose the capacity to translate their thinking into ways that are accessible for the rest of the organization. So people can look at them and they can seem a bit alien, like they see these things, they envision these ideas, but they have not really focused on building the capacity to play the other octaves. So they're always playing in that complexity thing that goes over people's heads so they can get very removed from their culture uh, and lose people on the way which is it's kind of it beats the purpose of operating from that octave in the first place Mm -hmm. and there can also be on the dark side a sense of specialness I can see these things that you can't see so arrogance and hubris and all of those dark sides of ego um, can also play out Mm -hmm. um at the latest latest octaves that's why the whole idea of you've got this piano expand into the next one take yourself out of your comfort zone but remember it's not about that one octave you're tapping into it's actually about playing a beautiful symphony using all of the octaves you've got at your disposal Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the real art of vertical development i think Mm -hmm. and value and I know that there there have been discussions about uh, the developmental, um, the vertical development being a growth model. So you need to be going up, 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 up. Uh, and I can also hear you and other people saying that this is something you can use uh, in the sense of tapping into each of them. And of course, uh, creating opportunities and striving to uh, get the the piano with as much as octaves as you can, but that not being the purpose, but the how you use the octaves in a proper context with, I don't know, adapting to people and so on. So on to, um, after we, we've got all this information for you, maybe you can tell us a bit about, because I'm working a lot with teams and leaders, uh, we have the, the, the team and we have the leader and we have situations where we have maybe, you know, uh, people with less access to octa- octaves. So I have access to less octaves, let's say around expert. And then I have a, a leader who is uh, higher. One of the challenges that you've already mentioned is the fact that I might not be able to connect with the with the leader. But being a leader in transformation, 
how can I, one, help my people grow or mm -hmm. get access, not grow, get access to more octaves? And mm -hmm. how, what can I do to be able to communicate or connect with them better? Yeah, I, I think on the second question you asked, I think the first maybe thing worth remembering is if you're playing a, re a later octave, remember you still have all the others it's not you like you're gonna forget to them, yeah. mm -hmm. so you have access to them so it's a matter of are you able to consciously adapt and understand that for this person who is operating a diplomat following the rules not stepping out of line is really important and maybe they don't have a voice so maybe the stretch for them is to expose them to context where they just get up and they do the presentation in a team meeting so you offer them opportunities to extend a little bit into their expert and you're able to grasp that from your redefining or transforming octave because you kind of see your own piano and, and you see where what's the octave this person is playing. What mm -hmm. could be a stretch for them? But then you've got another person who might be operating from expert in your team. What could be the stretch for them? Maybe it could be think beyond the task. So maybe you coach them a little bit around why they want to go about solving a problem in the way that they want to do it and what the impacts are going to be around, you know, on other people in the organization, something that the expert does not necessarily think about because they're more focused on, I have to do this to get to that outcome. Mm -hmm. So again, from your later octave, you, you can coach your people into what could be the zone of discomfort and growth for them, um, so, I, I which could be different for different people. Um, I'm in a diff I'm in a position of authority where I can, you know, um, create heat for these people in a conscious way. If I am in a, if I have access to more octaves, as you say, but what if it's different? What if I'm an expert or achiever and I I am leading a team, and maybe inside my team there are people who have access to more octaves? What's the issue there? Yeah, that's such an interesting one. And in my experience in coaching is probably one of the most challenging ones. When I work with people who realize that they are operating at a later octave than their boss. Mm -hmm. So then you don't need to do a bit of managing up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the principle of um, you can see where this person is coming from still holds true. So I'll give you an example. I had a client who was very much operating from diplomat experts. So when we were doing um, planning projects for their organization, planning projects, her focus was less on what is the goal here, how it will impact our people's capacity to deliver on what they need to deliver. Her focus was more on what will my boss think of this? Um, have we asked the higher manager X who always wants to have an opinion? So her diplomat was all about appeasing these people. Mm -hmm. So for me, from my perspective as the consultant or facilitator or co-creator of the program, my goal was what are these people going to learn? How is it going to help this business move forward and the teams and so on? But I couldn't get to that unless I helped her appease all of those worries she had about the people she needed to please. So we found ways to organize a meeting with manager X to let her know what's going to happen in the programs. So we have her buy-in. So, but I realized in hindsight, this was quite a few years ago, that it was a really good way to support my stakeholder where she was at, mm -hmm. but also support doing more with that program than we would have had we narrowed it and operated just from, yeah. you know, um, diplomat so I don't know if this is helpful but that's just an example of in this case consultant and client but it's the same thing she had she was in a position of authority she could have always said you know we're not doing this project anymore so in similar ways maybe there's a question around how do you support your boss and speak his or her language if you realize that you can see a broader perspective mm -hmm. what are their fears what are their hopes what are their needs that you can address intelligently playing the same octave Mm -hmm. um, while also maybe supporting them to see a little bit of what you're seeing with a bit of patience. So the response is more challenging. <laughs> it's a more it's challenging. More ch you don't scenario. have authority. Yeah. You just have to find creative ways of getting to them. But um, what you're saying is actually that the responsibility of bringing more light into the situation, into the relationship, is of the people who has uh, the person who have uh, who have a. Uh, broader access to the octave so the boss with the lower stage will not be able to see 
will not be able to look at himself and say, hmm, maybe I'm a bit, um, I need this. Um, uh. So it's uh, the, the responsibility of the one with a, a um, later stage. Yes. I would say so, <laughs> because you can't see what you haven't seen yet. But you can see again what you have seen before, even mm -hmm. though that might not be your playing field in the moment, but you can recognize you've played in that playing field. Mm -hmm. And just shifting out of work, and I know they're not comparable, but there are some similarities If into the home space. It's a little bit like that in our relationship with our kids. Whoever is more mature, more conscious, manages the situation. Um, it's their duty to manage the situation. So I can't blame my emotions on my kid because I'm operating, hopefully, <laughs> a little bit further along my piano than she is. So then if I have that perspective, how can I play her octave? How can I understand her perspective, but also support her to shift a little bit into whatever is the next growth for her? For her. Mm -hmm. um, so what yeah. we want actually in a team is that the, the leader is um, having access to more octaves, as, as many octaves as possible, yes. Uh, but in uh, the situation where we don't have that and we have a leader that's, mm, it's our responsibility to bring new light into the, the, the context. And that's a very interesting thing because um, I do meet people who come to me and say, okay, my boss is not doing this. I would have expected for him to do this and do that and so on. And what's my power and so on. So they don't have the I don't know, maybe they're not coming from redefined, maybe they're coming from achiever and the boss is from expert or something like that. So mm -hmm. um, it, there's a lot of, well, he needs to do stuff because he or she is the boss. I'm no, but the responsibility is ours. If we find ourselves in seeing more than our boss, step in. I think if we want to get to a constructive outcome, um, if we look at things developmentally, that's kind of the only way. Whoever is more conscious needs to, has more options. Mm -hmm. uh, the more octaves you are able to play, the more options you've got. Uh, and also, there's an invitation to stay really respectful of wherever people are at in their own development. Because I think with this kind of, when, when, when we have these kinds of conversations, if I'm operating at a later octave and this person earlier, it is so easy to put the better than kind of, hat on and kind of get this sense of superiority and I'm better than them and I can kind of play mm -hmm. them or, and I think that's a very risky path to go on because people are on a growth journey. Whoever is playing expert now might play achiever in six months. So holding respect for people's capacity to grow regardless of who they're at. And I'm conscious when it's your boss and you feel like they're not getting you, it can get really frustrating and it's hard to find compassion or empathy or generosity towards that person but I think it's really important and that too is a mark of development and of maturity to, mm -hmm. to be able to see where somebody's at but not judge them for it support them if you can um, and make things happen as well have that results orientation what do you want to create here mm -hmm. uh, how can you intelligently find a way to bridge towards the, pe the people who operate from other octaves than yourself mm -hmm. Great. Alice, how can we find more about ourselves? How can we learn about ourselves and where we are? And how can we help ourselves to have access to more octaves? I'm speaking from the achiever right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you mean, how can you learn more about the ver vertical development um, as a topic? Um, there's a ton of research, of really good research that's been created and continues to be created. Um, I'm really trying to collate some of that research on the Vertical Development Institute website. So there's a research page where people can actually dive into different studies, different theories on development. So if you're on the nerdy side, you can go there and grab some stuff. So up. Ver verticaldevelopment.com. Institute, verticaldevelopmentinstitute.com. Okay. So they, they have research, um, the geeks. Now, they give us one kilogram, not one ton, one kilogram of information where can we get well you know children? there is not one kilogram <laughs> <laughs> because i think um a lot of the people that i know and work with in organizations and otherwise we already do a lot of work in trying to grow ourselves so i think there's not one way really to grow 
if I were to just share the, the core of what I found in my own research is if you're able to purposefully create experiences for yourself that take you out of your comfort zone, but not so much as to feel completely unsafe. So it's heat and safety. Those are two extremely valuable ingredients for, for vertical development. Whatever you, it, it can be practical stuff. You go out there and present at that conference that you're terrified to present at and you expose yourself to that experience. You go out there and you talk to that person who is so different from you and pisses you off, but maybe you can just sit in curiosity to understand their point of view. So creating discomfort, developmental discomfort for, their, for ourselves is a first and probably the most important thing we can do to create development regardless of the octave that you know might be our main one. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing is finding partners in growth, finding people that we can actually have these types of conversations with um, to share our journey in one way or another. Um, I, I found in my, in my research that in learning programs, peer groups, people who went to the program together and they met regularly to kind of challenge each other's thinking were probably the most transformative part of what was otherwise a really incredible complex learning program. Mm -hmm. So those two things, um, take yourself out of your comfort zone and try, if you can, to not do it alone, to, to find the other people who are on this path. I think they are two potentially really useful things we can do for our development. That's great. And you mentioned something about a test. Can we test ourselves yeah. and see where we are? Can we uh, give the links to people in the description of this uh, this episode so that they can go ahead and test do you have any? I will, because there are multiple validated <laughs> tests and yeah. I have as a researcher respect for them all on mm -hmm. that same page on the Vertical Development Institute slash research, there is actually a list of tests. Uh, I can share with you a link to that page. So people can actually look at the different options there is, that exist out there. So I'm trying not to endorse any one option uh -huh. because I know there are a few that are all good. So I'd rather give people... You know, these are the ones that I know are rigorous. Go and have a look and see which which might be the best for you. Okay, so uh, we 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 do have opportunities to test and see where we stand. How many octaves do we have? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great, wonderful. Uh, um, I think this uh this, this whole information is very useful for uh, both team and organizations into understanding themselves in uh, work relationships, but it's also interesting for us to look at us and look at our personal relationships, to look at our development, to our growth, where do we see ourselves? What do we need to be? Do we have more opportunities to grow and so on? So I think this development, the vertical development um, is uh, catching on. And my wish is that maybe more and more organizations make use of it and then I don't know, organize teams and projects and uh, make decisions according to this as well. Because I know there are a lot of things out there to be taken into consideration when making decisions in organizations. So I would love to. I share that dream. In fact, when I created the Devel Vertical Development Institute, my core thought was I would love to see vertical development becoming the norm instead of the exception in organizations. Mm -hmm. Because I think we would have so much to gain from integrating this into the way we understand growth and i think uh, you already have two opportunities for people who work in organization and maybe are in the hr department or around people or maybe leaders that can benefit from uh, understanding what vertical development is better uh, and one is the vertical development practices for coaches yes uh, it's a uh, an on online course that the vertical development institute is um has organized and it's available people you can enroll you also benefit of a 200 dollars discount uh you have all the details in the description of this episode uh, you have to enroll by uh november 30th but uh this is one of the courses i'm i'm going to follow i'm um i started i, I got crowded with the learning <laughs> this autumn but uh this will be my christmas present and in my christmas vacation i will be doing this uh, this program as well uh, but uh you also are organizing a webinar on the 17th of november and it's uh, about uh how do we learn and how we support learning if i'm not mistaken i'm already in law in, in, in organizations that in that organization. one is very much for organizations yeah. mm -hmm. and, and I, so if people are in the hr learning space that is a great um 
yeah, it's a free webinar mm -hmm. to come and kind of check out what vertical development might look like in an organizational context. Yeah, and it's important to say that you being from Australia, it's 1 a.m. here, but that doesn't mean you cannot watch the recording afterwards. Yeah, yeah we're so... recording it. So if people enroll, they can always watch the recording mm -hmm. after. It's a very, very interesting topic. And uh, I'm hopeful that as many people from inside organization enroll so that they can snoop around what vertical development is. So having said that, we're going towards the end, Alice. And uh, are you ready for the fire rapid questions? I have some questions for you. <laughs> yes, yeah? I'm okay. nervous. I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be fine. So question number one, what's your favorite book? Oh, the book that I would say if all other books disappeared um, is Man's Search for Meaning, uh, Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's my favorite book. I've got a lot of books that I've illuminated in my life, but that was probably the most life-changing, um, paradigm-shifting book that I've ever read. Very, very nice book. Sec uh, second question. Tell us a moment in your life that has contributed in an essential way to who Alice is today. The moment when I probably shifted from opportunist into diplomat, oh, I was 12 years that. old. Oh, I was very, very competitive, straight A student, the annoying nerd in my classroom. Um, as far as I could tell, not many people really liked me, but I was really, really good <laughs> and liked by teachers. So academically, I was, yeah. Um, and um, I was so in conflict with so many of my colleagues that there came a moment when there had to be a vote on whether my good behavior mark should be <gasps> lowered, which was a disaster for a straight A student. As we know, in our country, that was like, it's almost a given that you would get a, a perfect score on behavior. So I was in that situation where, our, and our head teacher said, I'm, I don't want to make this decision alone. I would like the classroom to vote on whether we lower nice. Alice's good behavior mark. So I vividly remember this moment when my colleagues did not raise their hands when the teacher said, who is in favor? <gasps> I expected everyone to vote yes. It was their chance to get a revenge at, at the way I was actually behaving very opportunistically. Very, I was, I was a very tough, tough colleague to have around at that time. Mm -hmm. so for me that was um something it's a moment that I will remember my whole life and probably shifted the whole tra trajectory of what I've done in my life after that moment because it was the realization that I got it wrong and they could teach me something uh their generosity made me wonder what was I not seeing mm -hmm. so my obsession to understand how people's minds work and how I can grow myself to become a wiser human started on that day in fifth grade oh my god this, i got goosebumps <laughs> you didn't expect that <laughs> when you're, a, you're you, when you're a straight a student lowering your behavior mark that means no recognition for you at the end of the year so this is like uh, it's like the ultimate humiliation it's oh but i know didn't, because <laughs> i didn't get it i didn't receive that humiliation which was mind-blowing to me and yeah. it would have been well deserved by the way but the experience of almost getting it has uh, helped you shift so this is amazing this is yeah mm -hmm. question number three Alice um, what is your favorite game if you like to play I'm a player myself so not a board game player but a player uh -huh. um I play a lot of Uno with my little girl ah. she beats me constantly but I love playing with her and uh, we've got multiple board games but Carcass One is one that we particularly love at this mm. point in time and mm. it's a I... it's a really cool uh, map building board game ah. let me write it down maybe I'll take it with, to my kids as well um, question number four if you had the opportunity to, ha to have coffee with anybody alive or not real or not who would that be? Mm. Real or not, it can be a, um, could be a, fiction, a fiction character. Yeah, it could be a cartoon. It could be I a... would have loved to have a conversation with Dumbledore, an <gasps> honest heart-to-heart -heart conversation uh, where I get to ask him uh, some, some questions about the 
his life and how he came to think the way he does and how, how he thinks. Mm -hmm. I think Dumbledore operates at a very late stage that I would be very intrigued to explore with him mm -hmm. if he was a person I could have so dialogue with. A Harry Potter fan here. Okay, very, very interesting. Lifelong. <laughs> so the last question, Alice. It's not, a, it's not a question. It's more like a, a request. I give you permission to brag. Now, tell us three things you are proud of. Um, I'm proud that um, I had the courage and I wasn't alone in having that courage, but to leave a beautiful, beautiful life and a network of amazing people that I used to work with in Romania and move to Australia four years ago and start over from scratch um, and go through complete self uh, destruction and reconstruction. Um, I'm proud that um, part of that courage and that shift has been um, pausing for a while not for long but pausing shifting from facilitation into research and learning from scratch what it means to actually do research when I started my PhD I had no idea mm -hmm. what I was getting myself into so I've just completed it literally a few weeks ago and it's something that I I feel it's been I'm proud of it um, and feel more humble about as I said in the beginning what I don't know and the third thing um, is trying imperfectly to be a conscious parent and to genuinely notice the way I parent and the way I show up and call myself out. And I, I think I have a really beautiful relationship with my seven-year-old child who's teaching me so much, but I also feel I'm, I'm really working hard to uh, play that piano. Mm -hmm. so I think these are the three things very nice and you should be proud of your PhD and of uh, the you. courage of leaving uh, and going to Australia and you do have an amazing child as far as I know as I can see from the outside world you know um, I must say one thing and then we can wrap it up uh, the fact that people can also uh, follow you and listen to you in the newly launched podcast yeah uh, the, the the developmental the developmental yeah and I'm very curious about what you're going to bring to us because you are saying that you're going to bring all sorts of people that are in the research area and so on so it's an interesting thing to be uh, following these people so Spotify look it up the developmental Alice is there and she's going to start speaking in a, her own podcast <laughs> Thank you very much, Alice, for being here. It was Thank a real you, pleasure Karina. to talk to you. And uh, I'm um, looking forward to see what uh, wonders you'll be bringing to us. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I'll uh, ask you for tips, for podcasting tips on the side. Uh, My it's pleasure. It's been great talking to you. Thank you so much. And uh, have a good learning, people. See you next time. 